Throughout our middle school and high school experiences, we get introduced to several geometric shapes and their corresponding formulas. But today, I want to show you how you can derive and remember these formulas using simply the formula for a right triangle and a square. Let's set some ground rules. Whenever we get a shape, we are allowed to split it, rearrange it and glue it back together. Overall, we want to reach a square, rectangle, right triangle or any other shape we already know the formulas of. But let's say for now that we only know the formulas of square and rectangles, a squared and a times b respectively. Looking at those shapes more carefully, we can see they are both symmetrical around the center. If we were to split these shapes through their centers, we would get two pairs of equal parts of their respective shapes. Let's glue those back together again. Using those facts, let's get our first formulas for a triangle, specifically a right triangle. If we were to cut those shapes through their center and opposite corners, we would get two right triangles for both of these shapes. Since they are both half of their original shapes, then the two possible formulas are one half a squared and one half a b. To get the formulas for any other triangle, we need to play around with their shape for a second. Let's try to find the formula for the equilateral triangle first and see if we will be able to get the formula for any triangle from that. Looking at our equilateral triangle, we might get a few ideas for proving the formula. For example, if we draw a height from this side to this angle, then we create two right triangles. Though we need to bear in mind that the base is now half of the original side of the equilateral triangle. Those right triangles will have a formula of 1 half times a half times h, where h is the high length. We can further simplify this formula to get 1 fourth a times h. Since the equilateral triangle has two identical right triangles, we need to multiply the formula by 2 to get 1 half a h. We can improve this by finding the high length using the Pythagorean theorem for one of the right triangles. One of the sides is half of a and the other the hypotenuse is a, therefore we can get h by this equation and this square. We can further simplify the square root to get a square root of 3 times a over 2. Plugging that into our formula for the equilateral triangle, we get another form for it the square root of 3 times a squared over 4. But how do we prove the previous formula of 1 half times a times h applies to any triangle? Well, let's take a look. Here's a random triangle. Firstly, I'd start by placing this triangle on its longest side, such that its biggest side is the base of this triangle. Using that, we can be assured that the height of the side will go through the triangle. We do this because our previous trick would be problematic on a side that would have its height outside of the triangle. Fair, without that it isn't really a proof, but we have to split the triangle in my proof. And with heights outside of our triangle it'd be practically impossible. Feel free to try prove the following method on the other sides of this triangle. Now, let's try our trick with the height we did on our equilateral triangle for the base. We split our triangle according to this height and get two different right triangles with the same height. Our problem now is the fact that these triangles have various lengths of bases and thus we need to use another trick and that is to draw a midpoint on both of these bases. From those we draw a perpendicular line on that side. We split our triangle according to these lines and get 4 shapes in total. Apart from that 
we see that each pair has three right triangles in total, and therefore, if we arrange the shapes like so, for one pair we get a rectangle, whose fourth angle also has to be right. We now repeat that for the second pair, and we get two rectangles with the same height. If we were to join these together, what would you think the width of the total shape would be? It would be helpful to remember the law of distribution. Since we join two unknown lengths, we can express it as an addition of two lengths. Specifically, half of x and half of y, where x and y are the lengths of the original right triangles we got from the split of the original triangle side A. If we were to rewrite our length as one half of x plus y, we would see that x plus y was our original side A, and thus the width of the rectangle is one half A and the total area is one half of A times H, where H is our height length. So far, our attempts have resulted in pretty intuitive proofs of triangles. Let's move to something different. A parallelogram. Let's also make sure that this shape is on its longer side. The proof is rather intuitive. Looking at a parallelogram, we see that it is comprised of a rectangle and two identical right triangles. They are identical because they have two of the same sides with the same angle between them equal. Just a reminder that this is called a side angle side theorem. So if we were to cut off one of these triangles by its height and move it to the other one, we have a rectangle. Mind you, the length of the base or height didn't change by a bit. Since both of these triangles have the same height, we can look at a parallelogram as a rectangle, whose sides are the height of the parallelogram and its base, thus giving us the formula a equals b times h. This formula also works for a rhombus as well. Yet, this isn't the only formula for a rhombus. Let's take a look at the rhombus a bit closer. Instead of looking at the base and the height of the rhombus, let's talk about these instead. These are the diagonals of the rhombus. One of their properties is that they are perpendicular to each other. Therefore, this shape is divided into four right triangles of which all are congruent. If we disassemble these parts, we can create two shapes that result in the same formula. First one is of a right triangle, which can be created by moving two of the triangles into a rectangle and mirroring the other two triangles to get a right triangle, whose sides are lengths of the diagonals of the rhombus. We can also use the same to get a rectangle. Notice the resulting sides are half of one of the diagonals and the other side is the other diagonal. Therefore, our formula for a rhombus can also be A equals diagonal 1 times diagonal 2 over 2. We can prove something similar with a kite and for the same reasons as a rhombus. Its diagonals also create right angles and the longer diagonal bisects the shorter one. All are reasons why if we split the kite into parts by their diagonals, we can rearrange them into a rectangle, a rhombus or a trapezoid whose areas prove the same format of A equals diagonal 1 times diagonal 2 over 2. Let's also prove the formula for a trapezoid. If we split the trapezoid into a rectangle and two right triangles, we can guess its formula will have the areas for all three shapes. The formula for the rectangle will be its base times height. If we slide the two remaining triangles next to one another, we see it's a different triangle whose area is half of a different base times its height. 
But how do we express the basis of these two shapes? Looking back at the original shape, we see two bases of different lengths. I'll call top one B0 and the bottom one B1. For the rectangle, we can see its base is B0 and the triangle's base was whatever remained of B1. So we can express that by saying its base was B1 minus B0. So far we have found some easier and harder formulas for the shapes we know from school. Yet I want to show you how to use our method to discover one of many formulas for any quadrilateral shape. That is, any shape with four sides. Let's start by categorizing these shapes into two groups, convex and concave. In short, convex shapes don't have an angle greater than 180 degrees, while concave ones do. The final formula will differ depending on whether the shape is convex or concave. The first step to visualize our formula is to split the shape into simpler fragments we know the formulas of. In this case, that would be using the diagonal lines of the shapes to get two triangles. Let's choose diagonals that connect two angles under or equal 180 degrees. By doing this, we get two triangles in each shape with the base of this diagonal length. Let me show you both of them. In the concave scenario, one of the triangles will be in the other. Therefore, suggesting that the area of the concave quadrilateral will be the difference of these shapes, unlike their sum we are used to from other previous proofs. If we were to know the heights of all the triangles in a quadrilateral, we can create a formula based on the formula for the triangles. This is the only thing that will cause the sizes of each separate triangle to differ, since both have the same base. Plugging our formulas for both triangles, we quickly get the result that the area of any quadrilateral is the diagonal times the sum or difference of heights over 2, giving us the final formula of quadrilaterals for this video. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the video. I have some things I would like to mention at the end to give more context about the quality and production. Firstly, I would like to credit the music creator whose work I used in my video, at Avin. I'll leave a link to the songs I used in the description of this video, as well as her profile, so feel free to check her out. This was my first entry to a summer of math exposition, and the first video I created from start to end without any guidance from my peers. After finishing up the scenes to all the proofs, I wasn't thrilled with the result. I still have some improvements in audio recording and script writing I need to get to. Hope this video is of some educational or informational value to you. I would be glad if you would support me with these video projects I'm beginning to pursue. Try learning with me and I'll try learning alongside you next time. Bye-bye.